Howdy YouTube, it's your buddy Tony Ferraro outside of my house here in beautiful North Denton. Um, I want to read a short story uh, that I love, um, but not before I talk about the author who is a big hero of mine. Um, John Fonte, um, born and raised in Colorado, moved to L.A., moved to uh, uh, California to uh, become a writer, young, and became a screenwriter, worked all through the 50s and 60s and 70s as a screenwriter, um, but in the 30s and 40s he wrote some novels and short stories. And this is from a collection called The Big Hunger. Where's my flashlight? So it was put together by this Stephen Cooper fella in combination with John's wife, Joyce. <clears throat> and um, there's a bunch of short stories from the 30s to the 50s. I believe, I don't know when this one was written, but it takes place during his childhood. Uh, the Criminal That summer we lived on Madden Street, down near the high school. It was the best house we ever had, with a bathtub and jets for a kitchen range. A gas range was one of the big dreams of Mama's life. The jets brought it nearer realization. Now all she had to do was get a range. The rent for the Madden house was 25 a month, five more than we had ever paid before. It was a three-bedroom house of red brick with a real lawn in front. At last we had room to spare. Mama and Papa slept in the main room, Grandma had the one off the kitchen, and my two brothers and I slept in the middle bedroom. Everybody had a bedroom, which was quite a development in our family. Not many, not many Italians down on Madden Street. Besides our family, there was only Fred Bastoli, who was more bootlegger than Italian. Once Fred had been a friend of the family, but now that he was a lawbreaker, my mother didn't want him around. Grandma, too, had been fond of Fred Bastoli before he sold booze. Like herself, he was from the province of Abruzzi, and they had people and places in common. But now she hated him because he persisted in getting arrested and not caring for the reputation of other Italians. When Papa brought Fred to the house, <clears throat> she would greet him in, in Italian. She'd say, good evening, dog dung, or look at what came out of some woman's stomach. Fred Bastoli was a melancholy, taciturn Italian, but my grandmother always brought out considerable fight in him. He would answer, kiss my buttocks old woman and Papa would encourage him <clears throat> that's right Federico tell that old slut to mind her own business raging grandma would turn on Papa and say it would have been better if her womb had produced a pig rather than himself Papa would answer that since she was his mother he was surprised that he had not been born a pig this violent obscene language never meant anything one way or another they just talk like that Every fall my father made wine and stored it in the cellar. He never had much luck with the wine. It was either too sweet or too sour. He had no patience, and if the vintage had possibilities, he downed it before it had a chance to age. Thus, he was always going down the street to Fred Bastoli's house, where the bootlegger lived alone in chaotic squalor. On these trips, Papa carried his bricklayer's toolkit, a heavy canvas satchel. But he fooled nobody. The neighbors watering their lawns along the street looked at him brazenly, assuring him they knew what was in the bag. We kids were fascinated by movie criminals, but Fred Bastoli was hardly the fascinating type. He neither killed nor robbed. He carried no firearms, nor was he hunted by the police. He was in and out of the Boulder County Jail so much that we too despised him. 
He always came to our house by way of the alley. Standing behind the coal shed, he whistled for Papa. If we were having supper, Papa would go outside and tell Fred to wait. This created bad feeling at the table. Grandma grumbling and slamming things, cursing America, saying she should have drowned Papa the day he was born. Mom would stop eating, her body freezing in resentment, her eyes fixed on Papa, who started slamming things too, saying he wished he had never married, had never come to America, had never been born to a jackal like his mother, or wedded to a fool like his wife. If any of us kids so much as breathed heavily during this spell of fury, Papa would snatch a knife and threaten to slit our throats. And though this frightful warning was shouted three or four times a week throughout our boyhood, the nearest he came to carrying it out was the night he flung a meatball at my brother Dino. Dinner finished, the kitchen would be cleared and Mama would order us into the dining room and lock the door, and Grandma would go to her room. But Grandma was always full of fight. She made it a point to encounter Fred Bastoli, if only to spit at his feet or to insult him in some way. He returned spit for spit, insult for insult, until my father shouted for peace. Then she would retreat, whimpering to her room, beseeching God to burn down the house and everyone in it. One evening, while we were having supper, there was a knock on the front door. Papa answered, and who should be there? His arms loaded with packages, but Fred Bastoli. Hello, he said, frightened as he glanced at Mama and Grandma. There was something new and shining about him. It wasn't the new suit and green necktie. It was in his face, an eagerness to please, a friendliness. He even nodded to us kids. Grandma spoke up. What do you want, jackass? He tried to smile. Throw him back in the gutter, Grandma said. He turned piteous brave eyes on Papa, who moved closer to listen to some whispering. Papa kept nodding and smiling. Finally, Papa slapped him on the back. Good. He said, good boy, Fred. As he would a bashful child, Papa led Fred into the dining room. He stood before us at the table, his teeth clenched, his arms around the packages. For you, he said, pushing a long gift box towards Grandma. She withdrew as if he held a snake. Take it, Papa commanded. Grandma scowled and snatched the box. Fred searched his packages and found one for Mama. She hesitated, but Papa tore the box from Fred's hands and shoved it into Mama's arms. There were three other packages. They were identical, and Fred handed one to each of us boys. The thin boxes looked suspiciously like neckties. Carlo tore his fingers into the paper, but Papa told him to wait. With clean, shining black eyes, Fred Bastoli looked to my father, who cleared his throat as if he was about to make a speech. Fred Bastoli has been my friend for 35 years, Papa said. He was born 10 miles from my hometown. He came to America when I did. He worked hard in this country. Hod carrier, coal miner, dug ditches, hard work, no money. He's got no trade. So what does he do? He sells a little whiskey, a few bottles of wine. Is that bad? I say no, but the law says yes. So he goes to jail, three four times. Fred coughed. A fat, silvery tear rolled from his eye, slid down his cheek, and went crashing toward the floor. His emotion touched Grandma. She made a bouquet out of the corner of her apron and put her nose in it. Papa was pleased with his effectiveness. He raised his voice, lifted his hands, and eyes to the ceiling. Up there, he said, meaning heaven, is where they judge what's right and wrong. And up there, Fred Bastoli's got friends even if he's got none down here. Mama, Fred, and Grandma were all crying now, and Papa was so moved that he sobbed. My brother Victor snickered in embarrassment. This brought such a twisted, silent snarl to Papa's lips that Victor lowered his face and stared at the floor. But Fred Bastoli's a different man tonight, Papa shouted. He's reformed. He's all through with bootlegging. He wants to be friends, like before. Grandma jumped up and tossed her fat little arms around Fred. Thank God, she said. Ah, oh, thank our Heavenly Father. Laughing through his tears, Fred smacked a loud kiss into Grandma's gray hair. My Federico, Grandma said. My son. 
Better, so much better indeed than my own flesh and blood. Can we open the packages now? Victor asked. Papa nodded and we pulled the paper away. Neckties they were. It was extremely difficult to feel gratitude, but Mama forced us to thank the man. Grandma's package contained a black shawl. She was overwhelmed as she put it around her shoulders. Thank you, figlo mio, she said, the tears bursting from her eyes. A thousand thanks. And then she glanced at Papa. Ah, oh, that God that made you my son instead of him. Forty-five years, and he has never given me so much as a chamber pot. Fred's gift to Mama was a great coat sweater. We watched her put it on. She buttoned it up, pleased, and rubbed her hands over it. How about some dinner for our friend? Papa said. The question brought a flurry of activity as Grandma and Mama made a place at the table for Fred. Mom got a plate from the good china, and Grandma went to her room and returned with a linen napkin. Papa disappeared into the cellar for a pitcher of new wine. Through the front door, Carlo saw something in the street. Look, he gasped. Parked in front of our house was a brand new Packard sedan. It was a big black job. So new, it loomed like a shining animal. It was Fred Bastoli's car. He had bought it that day, only a few hours ago. We rushed outside and examined it closely, opening the doors, pushing buttons, honking the horn. None of us had ever ridden in such a new car. Let's ask him, Victor said. In the house, Fred was seated before a stuffed pepper and a glass of wine. Mama and Grandma hovered over him and Papa sat across the table. We asked for a ride in the new car. No, Papa said. We didn't ask you, Carlo said. I'm telling you. But Fred was expansive. Sure, I'll give you a little ride. They'll ruin your car, Papa said. Fred shrugged. How? I don't know. They'll find a way. But he gave in finally and said we could go. There was a condition, however. We had to get ready. This meant we had to change clothes, put on our Sunday stuff with a necktie. What for? Victor demanded. You don't ride in a new car looking like that, Papa said. We looked at one another. We were in corduroys, our school clothes. It was silly, but there was no arguing with him. Either we got ready or we got no ride. The long, hateful preparations began. We had to bathe, the three of us, in the tub, Grandma supervising. She used a washcloth, the way a carpenter used sandpaper, tearing away the flesh back of our ears. She could get a corkscrew effect by twisting the corner of the cloth, stuffing it into an eardrum, and twisting it. She removed scalp dirt by ripping it out with her fingernails. When the ordeal was over, we went to the bedroom where Mama had arranged our clothes. Fresh underwear, clean shirts, clean socks. That night, as a tribute to Fred Bastoli, we were tussed up in the new neckties. Starched and strangling, we were ready in half an hour. We trooped out of the bedroom and into the dining room. There sat Papa and Fred. Twice in that time, they had emptied the wine pitcher. Their faces and voices showed it. Go wait in the car, Papa said. We waited an hour. We were glutted with waiting, our bodies aching. The night had come. The street was in darkness. Through the front door, we looked hatefully at Fred and Papa as they leaned heavily on the dining room table. The new wine had moved them down, and they had succumbed uproariously. Though only four feet apart, they shouted at one another and banged the table with their hands. They were beasts, ugly beasts. Look at them, I said. They make me sick. What a father, Carlo said. Nuts to him. I'm leaving here some day, Victor said. I've had about all I can stand. Wait till I'm twelve. You'll see. I'll be gone. Then they'll be sorry. Finally, Mama intervened. We couldn't hear what she said, but her gestures indicated an appeal for us. Let them wait, Papa yelled. It brought a shriek from Carlo, a long, wild eerie howl of pent-up exasperation that turned his face blue as the cords of his neck tightened and the frightening wail penetrated the night. It was so terrifying that Fred and Papa stopped shouting and gaped at one another, sobered a moment. Papa arose on rubbery legs and Fred lurched out of his chair. 
They came through the house and down the porch stairs like men dying of thirst, groping at shadows for support. They almost fell on their faces as they reached the sidewalk, but as they approached the car, a touch of dignity stiffened them as they pretended to be sober. Papa pushed his head through the rear door and smiled disgustingly at us, his eyeballs floating. All set? He drooled. <coughs> All set? No. All set? He drooled. We didn't answer. Fred Bastoli had staggered around the car to the driver's side, but an odd impulse had made him keep going. Across the street, he wandered aimlessly, talking to himself. After a fashion, Papa went to his rescue. We could hear them yelling under the apple tree in front of the Whitley yard. Fred had forgotten that he owned a car. As they shouted, the lights on the Whitley front porch went on. It chastened Papa bringing out a last remaining spark of human decency as he quieted down and laboriously helped Fred back to the car. We could hear the two men gasping and reeling, their feet tangling as they stumbled toward us. We weren't interested in a ride anymore. Fearing for our lives, we tried to get out of the car, but Papa wouldn't let us. A ride we wanted, a ride we would get. But he's too drunk to drive, I said. I'll drive, Papa said. We groaned. My father had never driven a car in his life. Papa got Fred into the car just as Mama and Grandma came down the porch stairs. Fred was asleep with Papa trying to get the car keys out of his pocket. We opened the rear door and jumped out. Mama appealed to Papa not to drive. He ignored her, searching for the keys, pushing Fred about like a sack of onions. We were clear of the car by the time he found the keys, and as he groped the dashboard for the ignition, Grandma stepped forward with a broom. She pushed it through the door and beat the keys out of Papa's hand. They fell to the floor. As he searched for them, Grandma banged him on the head with the broom. The incessant whacking infuriated him. He seized the broom, twisted it from Grandma, staggered out of the car, and charged her. But she held her ground, her arms folded defiantly, her lips spitting epithets. Toe to toe they stood battering one another with insults. Mama reached in the car and put the keys in her sweater pocket. By now, nearly every porch light in the block was turned on. Neighbors stood in doorways and watched. Papa and Grandma suddenly stopped insulting one another. With Mama's help, they pulled Fred out of the front seat and led him into the house. Mama pulled down the blinds and turned off the lights in the front part of the house. One by one, the porch lights along the streets went out and doors were closed and bolted. The night was quiet once more. They stretched Fred Bastoli out on the sofa. He snored with his mouth open. Papa went into the bedroom. His shoes thumped the floor as he kicked them off. Soon he was asleep too, his snores as loud as Fred's. Disconsolate, we sat in the kitchen, Carlo and Victor and I. Grandma came in. She smiled at, as she opened her coin purse. She handed each of us a dime. Go to the movie pitch, she said. The movies. We swarmed over her, kissing and hugging her. She pushed us away and we pulled off our neckties and hurried from the house. It was the best house we ever had. The Criminal by John Fonte. Um, thanks for hanging out with me outside of my house front of my studio window. Uh, good night, good day, good internet love.